We can use Borat to <clears throat> do down the line. Okay. Um, I will hear on out be referring to my interview subject as Xerxes. Xerxes, do you give me consent to perform this interview on you? I give you consent. Please say it into the microphone. I consent. Okay, start the music. Very good. Okay, uh, oh, almost, okay, Xerxes, <laughs> I have, uh, asked you to come here today, um, under the, uh, pretense of an interview about literacy. Mm-hmm. Now, I understand that you have quite a literacy in history, is that so? Um, uh, I don't know about quite, but, uh, I like to think I dabble. You dabble in history? Can you define what dabbling means? Uh, I'm majoring in it. He's majoring in history, and is it, correct me if I'm wrong, is it, is it Arabic studies is what you're... Uh, your other... I believe my minor, if all goes according to plan, will be uh, Islamic studies. Islamic studies, my bad. Don't mean to culturally appropriate. <laughs> now, Xerxes, <laughs> so um, we're just, we're just going to kick this thing off. I got, let's see, like <laughs> six questions here. Hopefully this will last us. But I also plan on you saying some super insightful stuff because I believe you are a super insightful person. So that's when me. did your interest in history develop? Well, that's a good question. Um, for a long time, I was pretty passionate about the life sciences like biology, specifically epidemiology when I was younger. And I thought that was the route that route I was going to go down. But I kind of discovered that while I like a lot of that in theory and like reading about it, um, the nitty gritty of it just didn't really appeal to me. Um, and then I, in my freshman sophomore year of high school, I didn't really like the high school environment, so I ended up doing the uh, running start program right. uh, that was offered by my school district, and I ended up attending the uh, local community college in Spokane, and. My spring quarter of my junior year, I took a uh, American history class, which is interesting because it's not really my preferred topic anymore. And I really just kind of fell in love with the idea of it and like discussing the past and how that can affect us today and just kind of all sorts of ways that events can branch off and how everything develops. And so I decided to pursue it more. And the following fall quarter, I ended up taking a history class about the uh like about western civilization and i happened to get a different teacher who was styled a little differently a little unorthodox and um he really had this a lot of like interesting ideas that really like laid down like the foundation of that kind of got me into this like idea that oh yeah like this is what i want i'm interested in this is what Mm -hmm. i want to do because he he's there's different like ways that people look at history through different lenses like economy economy like war but he was more of a culture guy and like linguistics and uh so he'd make us look at things through that lens and kind of like try and understand how those things developed over time into like the world we have today and so that kind of culture how culture helped develop the world oh yeah culture like nothing in culture is ever born full-blown yeah. So any culture or idea or facet of our modern culture that we have was based upon layers and layers of precedent and, like, developed ideas over time. And so uh, I found that concept to be really interesting. That's cool. So is he your uh, spring quarter teacher? Is that who – or, sorry, fall quarter teacher? Was he uh, – would you say someone who really influenced you into uh, choosing history uh, as a – as a as a career choice, I suppose. Yeah, I kind of found like the his teaching style and just like the way he kind of had fun with it, even though he was kind of a grown up. Um, <laughs> like just kind of like he was just like a really like odd, weird guy. And Grump I, means grumpy. And I, I could kind of uh, <laughs> I could kind of relate to that, like just kind of like the vibe he put off and how like energetic he was about it, and like that passion that he had for it definitely was a motivating factor as well as just the subject matter yeah i've noticed that you when you when you speak about history you you seem super passionate about it as well like uh even even when you're not exactly like at your like full like awareness or like completely like in the right mindset you're always just able to like 
spout off like some crazy facts about like the Scythians or how like Arabs or no like about how the Jewish people of today aren't the real Jewish people of Israel or whatever. It's 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 very interesting. Yeah, you're you're giving me that look. That's like you're all wrong. <laughs> no, which is exactly I'm what I mean. You that look that that's a controversial topic. <laughs> That I'm not necessarily prepared to defend or associate with. <laughs> right, that's that's a question for another time. So your your fall quarter professor was you would say almost a, a a sponsor in your literacy of history. Now, would you define it as literacy? Um, what like what like it depends on how you look. You, at You literacy. have a vast knowledge of it, but like okay, so literacy as defined in this class, um, the the original like rhetorical term of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. The rhetorical term of it comes from, like, just literally being able to, like, read and write. But as of late, literacy has been expanded to a more broad term to mean, like, uh, like you're good at something, which I don't necessarily agree with, but there's been a couple, like, TED Talks I've watched yeah. that have, like, presented it as, yeah, like, I follow. video games are, like, a literacy because they present a challenge and you have to overcome that challenge by, you know, learning different techniques and then applying those. So in that way or perhaps your own definition of the word would you like say you're literate yeah in history? I, I would say so <laughs> um i could be more literate i can't tell you a lot about looking at history through an economic lens necessarily like more than like a intermediate base level um and uh i'm learning right now about like um kind of like power structures in history and mm. how those developed and i can't say i'm entirely fluent in it but i have a general understanding but overall in the general like topic i'd say i have a pretty good understanding um <laughs> any alien yeah i guess yeah i guess that that answers my question um <laughs> that so, it does yeah um so like i like i said before you're always able to like have some like cool facts which i find really interesting xerxes um uh like how did you manage to learn all this like i, I know you said you so okay let me let me hop back real quick you didn't so your 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 interest in history developed from more of like a scientific kind of mindset and your interest in like sciences and whatnot is that is that follow or yeah yeah for a good portion that's what I thought I was gonna do I guess I was always pretty interested in like the social studies classes too okay so the the social aspect of yeah, it which makes sense around um so like how do you like manage to learn all this stuff like obviously you're taking lots of history classes and you've been doing that for a while but like uh for me personally um I also kind of have a fascination with history just because I'm you know interested in the way how people used to act and how things change and how sometimes history repeats itself well more often than not it repeats itself and so I would always watch like the history channel on TV or like the military channel so like wars and stuff or something that um I have a, a decent amount of knowledge about you know specifically like world war ii and stuff just because you know when you're an eight-year-old and you run around like oh i want to be in the army you're just interested in like everything about it so was, did you ever have like that, that kind of like childhood wonder oh, fascination yeah. with it i used to watch the history channel growing up um i can't say like there's a kind of a dissonance between now and then where i thought you know like when you think about like you're talking about when you're looking you want to like mm. run around the gun and stuff there's like a distinct like gap between pretending what that is and actually like understanding what yeah, that yeah, yeah. involves so like you know i grew up watching the history channel and discover channel and like it's weird how like in a way your childhood feels like almost like a dream but you know it's like a real dream yeah and um i mean because you can like do like they always tell you like oh do whatever you want you know if you want to you know go be a unicorn or something do it which is something we need to destroy continue <laughs> um <laughs> But, like, you, uh, there's, like, a gap of, like, understanding what something is when you're a kid and now with, like, that life experience and brain development, I suppose. Um, war history is quite interesting, though. Um, war history is people like to, People like to minimize it because it's a interesting focus that a lot of, um, particularly young men have. Um, yeah. but you can't dispute the, uh, importance of conflict in humans. And I mean, that goes back to prehistory. Yeah, that's for sure. I always had, like, a... Like, war history in general is just cool because 
it's always it's always written by the victor, right? And so growing yeah, up, I always yeah. thought, you know, oh, America's this big, great giant. I mean, obviously... It's an imperialist state that <laughs> pretends not to be one. Yes, after coming to Western and, you know, well, not necessarily just after coming to Western, but, you know, growing up in high school and, you know, tr- uh, transition to university, you learn these kinds of things where you're like, you know, that doesn't sound very right. Yeah. Like how, you know, we used to think, oh, yeah, the chocolate we fed our troops was just good old chocolate. No, there was there was meth in that chocolate. Same thing. That's how they got the kamikaze pilots to do that. God, I'm jealous. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, that that that's you know interesting, interesting yeah. stuff. The um, an interesting way that um, like in the modern age, I feel like more people have the ability, in a sense, to be literate, not just because of the internet, but because like you know, like in like early scholarship, like or not early scholarship, but scholarship before like the advent of the internet. There was a lot of information that you had to go to college to know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, now with, like, the internet, even, like, you have access to almost all this information that these scholars have. But if you don't really know, like, the shop terms and you can't really understand that, a way that I kind of, like, broke that barrier for myself before I kind of started to understand the more complicated, like, terminology is honestly just YouTube. Like, yeah, honestly, yeah. Like, I, I, I've spent so many hours watching all sorts of different YouTube channels and videos about just topics I've interested in that I'm interested in that might not like exactly uh, get like the nitty gritty details or like mm. the overarching like theory, but can kind of just tell you like the general consensus of what happened in this culture and topic and what the scholars think about it in a more like understandable way yeah. that can kind of serve as like a basis of knowledge. And I guess that's kind of how mine started out was like pretty basic community college classes combined with my then pursuit of finding a youtube video yeah about the topic reading that hitting the wikipedia page about that reading like all the wikipedia pages related to that which i know wikipedia isn't a great source or whatever it's but a great place to start for sources starts. you can start <laughs> and then finding related websites and then eventually if i was passionate enough about a to- passionate enough about a topic i would then try and go buy a book on it yeah um i finished a book simply just called like arabs it's a 3,000-ish year history of uh, the, the Arabic people from pre-Islamic Arabia all the way through to the modern day. And that was an interesting read. And, like, I wouldn't be able to get to that level if I hadn't, you know, like, watched some YouTube videos that caught my eye about, I don't know, mm. like, the Islamic conquests after Muhammad. Yeah. Um, I, f- I feel that same way. Because, um, like, back in high school, like, my senior year, I felt I took a physics class. Specifically because I used to watch like a lot of like Vsauce and like Veritasium videos, which are like these YouTube channels that are like physics science based where it makes it fun and interesting to learn, right? And so I took this physics class thinking, um, well, it actually felt like I knew more about physics than anyone in the class. I mean, I already kind of had a precursor of knowledge, to be fair, but I, I think that's really interesting how, like, the modern era, like, the age of information supplies so much stuff where everyone's always like, oh, there's so much information, you could never possibly know anything, but, like, the other side of that is there's so much information, you can't possibly know nothing, and, you know? There's yeah. always something out there for you to find and then, like you said, get interested in and then, you know, research it deeper and then actually go check out, you know, an old, oh, what's this, pages? Oh, that's called a book. We still have those. <laughs> and then read one and nothing then actually learn stuff. Book, that's, that's true. It, I, I think that in this age of information, since there's so much disinformation, it's a good idea if you have the privilege and ability to access these kind of things, I guess. Um, start off with you know like almost everybody's access to the internet at least in the united states even people who have worse circumstances than i do um and you can kind of if you have the ability to access higher stuff but you can start out with like this kind of basis and you might pick up some disinformation but the trick is is it is not just staying at that level and you got to like build like a foundation i think that's a part of the reason i feel like i'm relatively literate in history is because i was able to use these easy access tools that everybody pretty much has these days Mm -hmm. and take that and then take what I learned from that and confirm it with like more I guess um valid sources so you know be that a college class or a like a scholarly reviewed paper book that I could then access later it's like there's like a foundation to it like think of like a pyramid the you know like the real like tidbits of truth or general confirmed truth Mm -hmm you know, like, you have to build up to that, I guess. Yeah. 
So you kind of spoke about it, but that kind of leads into my next question, which is how does your interest in history affect the amount of reading and writing you do? I know you said that like when you see like some sort of like niche video or something, you you know usually choose to research and follow it deeper, which you say you know you check out a book. So um, I have noticed that you have been doing uh, quite a quite a large amount of reading. Um, but you know, granted, I didn't know you before you know the past couple months. But like, has history influenced your reading? Yeah. Um, topic of choice, obviously, or just, like, the amount in general that you do? I read a lot more, um, like, history, like, not textbooks, but, like, like they're not, I wouldn't call them novels, but they're almost like novels in the sense mm -hmm. that they tell a story. Like, the Arabs book I mentioned before, even though it's, like, I guess a nonfiction book, you know, it tells a narrative, like, the development of this people, this culture. And so I've distanced myself, I think, a little bit more from, like, fiction books, which is actually kind of unfortunate because mm -hmm. I think that fictional tales reflect a lot on culture, so I've been trying to get back into that. Fair, yeah. But, um, yeah, I'd say that that impacts my amount of reading more. Uh, I'd say it also uh, impacts a lot of writing because most of the history courses here at Western are, you know, you don't really take tests unless it's like, yeah. a big, big lecture class generally it's more to do with um like essays so i just finished an essay last night about a concept i'm relatively new to which is called orientalism which is a like western stereotyping of eastern cultures <laughs> and i won't go super deep into that but it was interesting and i learned a lot and in the process of writing and researching i think i learned a lot so i think that those two con like ideas of writing and reading are really intrinsically linked oh for sure because if you if you learn something from something you read you should be able to write about it, you know? Yeah. And it, you, when you're in the process of writing, you should be doing some reading in order to write better about something. That's for sure. I feel like, yeah, that's a definite, hey, uh, louder for the for the public schools in the back. If your writing isn't teaching how to read and if your reading isn't teaching how to write, what do you, what, come on, what are you doing? <laughs> Amen. Um, Alhamdulillah. Alham, that means uh, God be with us. It's, I guess, thank God I'm good. So Hopefully. we can go ahead and talk about that because literacy can also be extended to more than just reading, writing, and then, you know, playing video games or that sort of thing. Literacy, I suppose, um, language itself can, you can, I mean, you can be fluent in language, but you can also be literate in it, which, you know, reading and writing just in general. But I, I hear, a little birdie tells me that you're taking Arabic classes. I, you want, I you want to tell me about those? Um, they're really hard. <laughs> Um, it's, it, inshallah. Yeah, God willing, I will make it into next quarter, inshallah. <laughs> um, yeah, um, that kind of stemmed off my interest in history, because mm -hmm. uh, my personal a areas of interest in the world in terms of history at the moment, geographically speaking, are probably the Middle East and Central Asia, both which uh, are uh, influenced heavily by uh, Islam, and <laughs> Arabic and Islam while a language and a religion are definitely not the same thing, are very intrinsically linked. Yeah. Like, the spread of Arabic across the Middle East is a language, oh, and it's sure. script, and even, like, Persia, which uses the Arabic script, even though they speak a language more related to ours mm. than that they do to Arabic. Um, now, this might be uh, 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 me making a f uh, fallacy here of uh, equivocation, but would you say... So, okay... So you talked about how uh, language and religion can kind of be linked together. Would yeah. you say that like Arabic has a more like its its language style is more kind of like religiously based? Because I oh, mean, I yeah, like yeah. I've noticed that like most of the most of the Arabic phrases you speak to me have something to do about Allah or like their God or like some sort yeah. of like religious like even connotations yeah. to it. Even secular Arabs or non-Muslim Arabs, uh, I, I'm using Arab by the way as a uh, linguistic term rather than a racial term because Arabs, in my opinion, are anybody who speaks Arabic at this point, mm -hmm. whether or not it had an original ethnic distinction. Um, but uh, Arab Asterisk. <laughs> Arabic uh, developed, like, uh, Arabic existed before Islam, for sure. But um, after the rise of Islam, like, a lot of, like, common phrases in Arabic, whether the person is Muslim, uh, Christian, Jewish Arab, or uh, just, like, an atheist Arab, like, the phrases are, like, Allah is still used quite a lot in like different words like when someone says in the egyptian colloquial isaic meaning like how are you basically you would say generally like customarily alhamdulillah 
which is, you know, like, thank God I'm good. Mm -hmm. And even if they maybe didn't believe in God or... They'd, believe, they'd still, yeah, they'd know, still say Recognize it. it and be like, oh, and yeah. And it's just because the, the two, like, the spread of Arabic as a language coincided with the spread of Islam across the Middle East. And, uh, you know, the Quran was written initially in Arabic. Love and it. Gotta love the Quran. Even, even though it has uh, been translated into other languages, uh, one of the highest, like, att attainable goals of a of a non-Arabic speaking Muslim is to understand and be able to read the Quran and pray in Arabic. Now, I've read some like articles back in my religion studies class. Um, I can't, I probably should have actually done the readings, but I remember there was this bit because we had a whole unit about like colonialism mm -hmm. and there was this um, tribe of people where there were these uh uh, missionaries that came over or whatever and they were the only ones that knew how to speak their language mm -hmm. and they had these sacred texts but the people who actually like worship these texts and the people that were actually a part of this um, uh, community and uh, for lack of a better term group um, they had the the missionaries had to read the sacred text to them and when you're reading something in a different language most of it is you know personal interpretation because you know language has an effect on how you read things if you're you know if you grew up speaking english obviously you're gonna look at spanish or arabic differently and point out those kinds of like flaws and things so um would you say that like with a Quran and whatnot, like you said, like that's like the big goal is to be able to like read it and stuff. And most of the religious texts are based off of you know interpretation. But like, what are your what are your, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that language and culture are also intrinsically linked, and I think that your na going from your native language, reading something in your native language, like this definitely applies to the Bible, which by the way has been translated yeah. from from my Greek and translated like a thousand different ways. By the way, for all yeah. my Christians out there, louder for people in the back. <laughs> um, but uh, not just uh, like the translation aspect, um, and then like reading it in that language, but also like you know, language affects the way people think for sure. Like the structure of the yeah. language does impact the way people think. That's like a proven fact in linguistics. Um, but also I think there's a cultural aspect it, to it because, uh, like, actually we talked about this in my history class today, the history of the modern Middle East with, uh, Hakeem Name. Um, shout out. Yeah. We, uh, we talked, we talked about how different cultures interpret the Quran differently. And, uh, so like passages about like, um, like women, and like the way the women are treated in Islam can definitely vary in, in, in interpretation, and then obviously once interpretation implementation, depending on the culture. So like, uh, for example, like with marriage, people like this, a lot of Westerners perceive um, marriage and dating in Islam as kind of arranged, mm -hmm. and that's more the case in places like India and Pakistan because they have like a cultural like interpretation that leans them that way. Whereas someone in like Turkey, which is a pretty secular place these days, relatively compared to the rest of the Middle East, I won't claim yeah. that they're perfect, <laughs> perfectly secular, not that it's implied that secularism is perfect. Um, their idea of dating and marriage is much less like structured and family based. Yeah. So it definitely language and culture can kind of fuse together there and affect people's interpretations. So I guess there's this idea that maybe if you're reading it in Arabic, you have a more pure interpretation. And I don't know yeah. if I agree with that or not, but it's just something to think about, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so it's just, I mean, we're like three and a half minutes over, but we can keep going. So we'll, we'll wrap up here with my final question to you, which is how, uh, so you talk about how you're, you know, mainly interested in like the cultures of these different places and the history of these cultures so how has learning about that um obviously it's gonna change your world views but how has it affected like like specifically like your uh, uh ethnocentrism your idea that things here are the same as everywhere else and that's the way it should be i th uh, i would say that reading history combined with the I'd say minimal knowledge of anthropology has definitely made me understand like the idea of cultural relativism a little more, which is mm -hmm. the idea that like y y there's not necessarily like a universal right way. And being in history classes, understanding that people in different spaces live different ways and think different ways. I've kind of, it's disillusioned me a little bit with the idea of 
American democracy being the only way, which yeah. is something that a lot of Americans think. I'm not sure that, like, for example, in the Middle East, that that's something that necessarily has to happen. I think that nece- what they have going on right now isn't necessarily any better or worse. Well, it is worse in a lot of places, <laughs> but... Syria. It doesn't mean that it has to be the way that we do things. And I don't know. It's given me, like, knowing knowing knowledge or having knowledge about, like, the history of some people, groups, and cultures and the way that things have developed has definitely made me um, take sides on certain, like, complicated issues. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to say right now, free Palestine, baby. <laughs> um, whoop, whoop. <laughs> and that... You could argue because of my interest in Arabic culture that I might have a bias and you might be right, but I've done a lot of reading on it and through history classes and just like, I don't know, like popular culture and meet news media and made up my mind about it. But I'd like to say that I combined what I read from media with what I know about history to yeah. kind of come to that conclusion. So I'd say that history, at least in certain places, it you know, like I could go on about, you know, American intervention in yeah. Central, Amer- Central America or all these other places. But I, I'd say that the combination of all these, like, different amalgamations of different bits of knowledge have definitely made me pick sides on things. Yeah. And um, affected my worldview for sure. Yeah, I had this idea the other day when I was actually sitting in English class. So, Katie, you can – I'll give you credit for this one. Um, but I had this Ooh, idea <laughs> uh, that – so – uh, let's let me let me put you in a scenario, right? So you go to Western, right? But before you came to Western, um, let's say that you had some very specific like ideas on a certain topic. Um, one is not coming to mind at the moment, so I'll go with the only one I could think of, which is abortion. Let's say that you really, um, I don't know, you weren't like necessarily like super pro life or super pro choice, but I mean you were more kind of just like. Like, yeah, babies, I guess, have a right to life. But that was just, you know, the way you were raised. Um, And then you come to Western and you start, you know, learning all these different facts, all these different, like, viewpoints and sides to these kinds of arguments. And you go back home to the people who still have the same viewpoints, still have the same way of life that they live. And you start talking to them like, oh, hey, I don't, you know, think that's the way things should be anymore, right? And a lot of people, you know, given the... Uh, sort of, sort of just like connotations of Western, like oh, you're just hella liberal now. You're just, you know, you just are choosing liberal s- sides because that's the school you went to. Where, as in fact, no, it's more not necessarily that a school changed you. It's just you became more informed on a topic, right? I, I would say on a lot of issues, reality tends to have a liberal slant. Say again, reality tends to have a liberal slant. Um, but, you know, I, I agree on to an extent, though, with some of the beliefs that um, colleges do have an ability, scholarship doesn't have an ability to indoctrinate because scholarship doesn't just involve, like, studying and, like, learning. Yeah, there's like, there, like there, community. There, there's no such thing as non-political people. knowledge. All knowledge produced by scholars has a bias, often has a political slant, and to say that on some level, like if you, you can be indoctrinated if you're not careful, if you have, if you take, a cert, say a certain department at a school has a particularly liberal, liberal or conservative bias, and you t- just kind of li- listen to these people's opinions and conclusions that they've come to based on this tradition of scholarship over mm-hmm. the years, um, and you just kind of take it as fact, that can be dangerous. I think that there's a fine line between trusting experts and you know like learning and from them and like i can't put 100 percent faith in everything that any teacher here says to me unless i you know i have to reconcile that with my own beliefs what i've read and all these things um so you know i bet you yeah if i if i went home and said some of the things i've said to you to people in my family i'd probably get told oh i'm just being indoctrinated by like a liberal professor and i don't necessarily think that's the case yeah it's just you just now like it's not even yeah. that it's just you're more informed which yeah. which is the central idea it's all about getting information you don't you don't come to a university to change your beliefs or whatever you come to learn and learning comes with 
showing other mm. sides of things and then realizing that eh, that's, you know that probably wasn't right what I used to think. What what, what what's something I I like at least in the history department is um, a lot of the readings I I read before we discuss them so I get to come to my own conclusion and maybe it's less informed than scholarly boy but like less informed than my like professor might have mm -hmm. but you are, um, you're one of those people if, where you sit in the back of class while they're talking and you're like <laughs> this guy <laughs> but like you know if he says something that's um he or she I should say but I've only had male they professors. I've, say I've they had, were I've at western had, I've only had male professors so far actually which is kind of interesting but if if they say something <laughs> that I don't necessarily agree with you know, like, I do have this text in front of me that I can work on interpreting to see, like, and kind of, like, you know, critique what they're saying. That's not necessarily to their face, but to, in my own head and kind of come to my own conclusions. So, like, you don't have to just, like, take everything that this professor is about to use, like, face value. So, like, you, like all these people are just saying, like, I, I assume there's more than just me thinking like this. So, all these people are just like, oh, yeah, your professor just indoctrinated you. Like, often not. Often I've just come to a similar conclusion that they have, but yeah. sometimes I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, it kind of just bring us full circle. I guess you could say literacy is, Come. Mo <laughs> is more or less um, an interpretation of how you uh, see things, right? So... E, um, how I perceive you having a literacy in history, someone else might say, well, that's just him just knowing something, right? So, um, yeah, literacy. It's more than just reading and writing. Woo! All right, they're probably cut out, so that's Yummy. Cool. All right, this concludes Yummy. my interview. Yummy knowledge. This, oh, God, okay, can I just do an outro? No. This concludes my interview with Xerxes... Uh, Gubaglam, Baglab the uh, fifth. I prefer uh, Anashurawan, actually. Anashurawan is that like it's an honorific? Is that like is that like cheer wine? Is that, is sure. that, is that sure thing? Okay, this is the end of my interview. This is being used underneath the fair use doctrine. All fair use. I'm interrupting it to not get the full thing because it's his own thing. It's a creation. This is not copyright.